The informed eye revealed its classical origins just as clearly as the Latin adage. So Pastorius was very American in defining himself as an English language Pliny. But Pastorius always puts his own twist on every tradition. For one thing, he can't just say one way that it's always good to admit that you've taken things from other people. He has to say it in many different ways. And in the Beehive, there is a marvelous series of acknowledgments that he is saying nothing that others haven't said before. Uh, from Seneca, from Synesius, on and on and on. Uh, I refer you just to the end where he says, in Latin, and by the way, see number 16 of the Spectator. Here he refers, not of course to a classical source, though he's writing in Latin, but to an article in The Spectator, that marvelous English periodical. This is written by John Hughes, a poet, musician, and librettist, and he denounces his contemporaries for their idleness and offers the commonplace book as a remedy. Seneca, in his letters to Lucilius, assures him there was not a day in which he didn't either write something or read and epitomize some good author. And I remember Pliny in one of his letters where he gives an account of the methods he used to fill up every vacancy of time. Sometimes, says he, I hunt, but even then I carry with me a pocketbook that whilst my servants are busy disposing of the nets, I may be employed in something that is useful to me in my studies. This passage is suggestive in more than one way. It shows that Pastorius, like most commonplacers, used intermediary as well as original sources. He was just as happy to take his Seneca from John Hughes and the Spectator as he was to take it from Seneca, and he did both. It shows that Pastorius was sympathetic to the idea that reading and recording the results in this extraordinarily systematic, energetic way was a kind of ascetic discipline and exercise. But most important, it reminds us that commonplacing was not a strange or archaic pursuit in the 17th or 18th centuries. It was actually just as fashionable as it had ever been. In the preface to The Tale of a Tub in 1711, Jonathan Swift says, I was going to expand my satire with a panegyric of the present and a defense of the rabble, but finding my commonplace book fill much slower than I had reason to expect, I've chosen to defer them to another occasion. Pastorius, in other words, connected his practices on the one hand with the ancient Pliny, on the other hand with contemporary London's journalists whom he loved. In fact, he loved the spectator so much that he got himself in serious trouble with a female friend since he kept her copy of the fourth issue all winter and he had to have another friend intervene with her in order to be able to borrow the fifth copy. So Pastorius sees himself at once as Pliny and as an Augustan humanist in the way of Swift or Pope or one of his English contemporaries. He sees no contradiction between the two. So this is a humanistic but also a very modern project, something important to remember when talking about the Enlightenment. Even Pastorius's most iconoclastic writings, or seemingly iconoclastic writings, grow from deep roots in the tradition of scholarly pursuits. His most important book was the description of Pennsylvania, which his father published in 1700. This is actually a collection of letters that he had sent back to friends in Germany rather than a complete work. And the most elaborate of these letters, written in Latin and sent in 1688, so amused its recipients that it was printed in one of the new journals that amused the learned public of Germany in the, in the late 17th and early 18th century. Tetzel's monthly conversations among good friends on all sorts of books and other pleasant stories. It's a wonderful text. Pastorius tells his readers to, a, to take a map and zero in on the Delaware and then on Philadelphia, to imagine themselves in Philadelphia kind of humanistic composition of place, recovering from seasickness, to imagine Pastorius eagerly welcoming them to, the, to the, his house. He invites them to enter. He shows them Germantown with its massive new population of 50, grown from its original 13. He shows off the prosperous houses of the Germantowners, the farms that they have created, notes that they have no need of a wall, and then suggests that he and his visitors walk out of town to visit the Lenape Indians. 
He shared William Penn's warm sympathy for those Indians, which made possible the so-called long peace between them and the white settlers, characteristic of this early period of Pennsylvania's history. And in this letter, Pistorius describes them admiringly and at length. He talks about their intelligence, their canoes, their tobacco, their personality traits, their ways of courting and marriage, their religious rituals, and their ways of curing the caring, sorry, caring for the sick and curing the, and burying the dead, not curing them. The letter winds up with a list of phrases in the Indian language and in translation. Pastorius comments, if you can divine the origins of these Indians from these bits of evidence, or from the fact that they call their mother Anna, their wife Squaw, their old woman Hexus, their devil Minito, their house Wicko, their land Hockey Hawken, their cow Mus, their pig Kushkush, I will admit you're a really good philologist. <laughs> Now, it's a wonderful letter. It will remind anyone who reads it of the ethnographic writings of slightly later men like Lafito and La Montagne. In fact, it really calls up in mind that wonderful traveler's world of the 18th and early 19th century that Harry Lieberson has described in, in a wonderful recent book. And this impression of immediacy, of a sense that sense impressions and empirical evidence matter more than a traditional learning is strengthened by a passage at the beginning of the letter. As Pastorius takes his friend on his imaginary walk to meet the Indians, he says, well, let's not walk in silence like sheep. Let's talk a little about the origin of the Nile, or what is equally obscure, that of our Indians. Some think, not without plausible clues, that they are the descendants of the Hebrews. But their native language suggests that some of those who live a bit farther from here must come ultimately from Wales. <laughs> These would be the Indians of Bala Kinwick. <laughs> European scholars, he says, will work out the dates and details of their navigations across the Atlantic. But I, since I have hardly a single book, will not take any part in this dubious battle. Now here, Pastorius really seems, in Latin, to be distancing himself from humanism and the culture of the learned and their universities. He refuses to join in what was a very widespread debate at this time about how to fit the Indians into the table of nations in the book of Genesis. And instead of doing that, he makes fun of all the normal ways of answering that question. Well, it's always hard to know when a past writer is joking. Think about Thomas Hobbes. <laughs> In this case, when Pastorius offers this account, is he really rejecting the world of learning, or is he simply playing one part of it against another? I argue that that's what he's doing. From the 16th century onwards, travel had been a central form of knowledge making in the Republic of Letters. Writers had codified the proper way to travel. Men like Theodore Zwinger, who wrote the travel method of 1577, the Methodist Epidemica. They told you where to go, who to talk to, what to look at, what sort of notes to take. Read your Theodore Zwinger and you would be Pico Iyer. You would know exactly how to capture all of those impressions and bring them home. Dozens of young men bore these instructions in mind and carried the books that transmitted them in their wallets as they made their grand tours of Europe or, trans or transferred their impressions to imaginative works of literature. Now, Pastorius was deeply connected to this tradition of seeing travel as a vital form of knowledge. It was practiced by his father, Melchior Adam Pastorius, who wrote a wonderful memoir of his own youthful travels in Italy, France, and Germany, which is preserved in the University of Pennsylvania Library. And you see the beginning of it here, uh, in which it's Melchior Adam Pastorius's itinerary and curriculum of his life, that is, his complete description of his travels and his whole course of his life with lots of remarkable events and pleasant things from every place and rarity that he saw. That's the kind of stuff to give the troops. So Pastorius knew this tradition from his father. He also knew it from his library, A Travel Guide to Italy by Francesca Schottus, which was in his collection and is now, like the rest of his books, in the Library Company of Philadelphia, starts with an actual questionnaire, which, one, which the learned traveler was supposed to use as he observed a new place, to look at the geography, the name of the place and its founder, its geographical features, its private and public buildings, its schools, and then the customs of the ordinary people including their ways of earning their living, their clothing, their crafts, everything that Pastorius talks about in his treatise. Now, 
in taking travel as occasionally refuting ancient authority, Pastorius actually follows in the great tradition of learned travel writing. His own favorite work on the Americas, not, and, and this is quite characteristic of it, was not a recent one, but Jose de Acosta, the great Jesuit's natural and moral history of the Indies from 1590. And many of you here have read the magnificent passage in Acosta in which he describes how crossing the equator, he found that he was not only not extinct from the heat, but actually cold went downstairs, went down below in the ship to get himself a warmer garment, and found himself laughing at the Aristotelian geography and zone theory they had learned in university. Of course, he then says, by the way, Ptolemy had this right. So it's not all ancient authority that's wrong. Experience lets you choose between ancient authorities. It's here, I think, in that spirit of learned travel writing that we can best understand what Pastorius is doing. And it's actually, I think, in a particular learned world that we can situate Pastorius best and really understand the sense of his enterprise. Now, the dominant figures in the intellectual world of the Holy Roman Empire that Pastorius knew as a young man, the so-called polyhistors of the 1650s, 60s, and 70s, are figures who nowadays look, as Don Kelly described to me and him, as dinosaurs, the ramping, enormous inhabitants of a strange kind of pedantic park. These were men who took all knowledge as their province, past and future, nature and culture, history and astronomy. My personal hero, the Jesuit Athanasius Kircher, traced the history of the world's peoples from before the flood to his own day, clambered into the crater of Vesuvius to study volcanic eruption, adhered to the Copernican system at a time when Catholics were forbidden to teach it, girded up his his skirts to play football against the nasty Dominicans next door, and invented the cat piano, which you see in his way. And he presented his discoveries not only in the stately form of Latin folios, but also in the magnificent material form of his apartment in the Collegio Romano, a Kunst und Wunderkammer, down in the center of which marched a stately series of Egyptian obelisks. Now, the one thing you really need to know to appreciate this is that the obelisks were wooden models which were rediscovered not long ago. Uh, they're about five feet high. The room was actually about seven feet high. So the human figures are a little bit too diminutive to be realistic. But what you see there is the theater for stately ceremonies of reading and knowledge transfer, where men like John Evelyn would come to see here, here greet him in stately Latin and be rewarded by being shown a shin bone of one of the biblical giants, or being told how to interpret the hieroglyphs of the obelisks of Rome in Kircher's patented wrong but romantic manner. Now, that was the world that Pistorius left, and when he looks back to the world of learning as a sterile and wrong-headed, that's the world he looks back to. But if you look at the world of learning that his contemporaries were building in Germany, contemporaries with whom he was in contact, you'll see that it was a different one, at once erudite and rebellious, trying to renew traditions of learning while cutting away the senseless. Take, for example, Johann Burkhard Menke, the erudite author, editor of the Acta Eruditorum, one of the greatest journals of this period of journals. Menke describes the of scholarship in two wonderful lectures on the charlatanry of the learned, which were published in 1713 and 1715. And you see the learned as a kind of stage charlatan on the right. These are wonderful. He makes great fun of the scholar's love for honorific forms of address. You see many demanding to be called clarissimus, who are absolutely unknown outside their city, magnificus, who are oppressed by poverty, Consultissimus, who have no advice to give. He sketches unforgettable Daumier-like acid portraits of self-absorbed scholars. Here's Johann Zega of Wittenberg. He had an engraving made showing the crucified Christ in himself. From his lips come the words, Lord Jesus, do you love me? And from the lips of Jesus comes the answer, yes, most eminent, excellent, and learned imperial poet, laureate and victor of the American University, I love you. Kircher, 
comes in for brutal ridicule in Menka's oration. Menka tells the story of how some impudent boys in Rome found a piece of rock, engraved meaningless designs in it, gave it to Kircher, and exposed the trick after he had unraveled the secrets of the hieroglyphic mess.